wanted to welcome you all. You know, this virus and the shutdown and the social distancing and the and it's contributed to a lot of different kinds of suffering, you know, sickness and death and grief and economic hardship and isolation and loneliness and uncertainty and fear and anxiety and relationship and tensions and stuff like that. It's also contributed to an incredible slowing down and going in. Um, tons of kindness and generosity and heroism. And so I wanna welcome all of that and welcome all of you, whatever you're experiencing and wherever you are around the world. Uh, I know there's people here, the ones who signed up from Australia, Bulgaria, Canada, Cyprus, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, Israel, Poland, Russia, Slovakia, South Africa, Spain, Switzerland, the United Kingdom, Ukraine, the US. So anyway, welcome everybody. It's nice to have everybody here. And so yeah, in this time we're all called to take care of ourselves and take care of each other. And that's hard to do when we're stressed and we're overwhelmed. So, uh, and it's especially hard to do when the, tr when the, when what's happening in the world um, is triggering old trauma. Uh, so a lot of people who grew up with violence and abuse and neglect and personal collective and intergenerational trauma and historical trauma of all kinds live with a sense that the world is not a safe place. And uh, yeah, this moment of global uncertainty can amplify that feeling, which is painful for many. Um, there's a lot of people also who are doing great during this time. It's like, I get it to relax. So that's awesome too. Um, in times like this, especially if we're having a hard time, we need resilience. Resilience means the capacity to bounce back and to recover from our difficulties. Um, and process work has lots of great tools that help us with our resilience and, uh, and help us to learn and grow from our difficulties. So in this class, I'm going to talk about trauma and how it relates to the pandemic and to this unique moment in the world and offer a few inner works that come out of these ideas. Um, going to do a couple of short ones together. And then the last one, uh, we're not going to have a chance to do together because um, of the short time probably. Um, but I'm going to demonstrate that with somebody and then you'll have it and you can, uh, you can do it on your own later. So um, yeah. Am I speaking loud enough? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, good. Um, and am I speaking slowly enough for those of you who don't have English as a first language so far? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Good to know. All right. Okay. So, um, so this class, I just want to say, isn't about the pandemic in general and how to work with the pandemic in general. Um, so Arnie's got a great post on Facebook about working with the pandemic. Mox and Ingrid did great classes on working with the pandemic, and I'm sure other teachers around the world are doing that too. Um, and it's also not a class about tr trauma work in general. If you're interested in that, there's a free video from a class that I did at Process Work Online 
Uh, Andrew's going to put that link in the chat, or you can just search Process Work Online and go to their shopping thing, and then you'll see my video on a gentle approach to working with trauma or something like that. You can get that for free over there, or you can just email me and I'll send you the link. Um, and uh, so what this class is about, it's about working with the pandemic when you get triggered by it and you have a hard time processing it or it triggers old trauma. And whether that is for you or maybe for your clients. So that's what this class is about. So I just want to say I have mostly been having really deep, deep experiences during this pandemic, working on the virus, working on all kinds of things. I just want to mention one. I was working on what I was the most afraid of. And I realized what I was the most afraid of actually was dying of COVID-19. And uh, I just imagined myself all feverish and with a terrible headache and coughing and coughing and not being able to breathe because my lungs were so scarred and I couldn't breathe. And I imagined myself lying in the hospital without my family there because my family wasn't allowed to come because they would get sick and feeling my fear, feeling my anger at what was happening, saying, no, 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 this shouldn't be happening, feeling myself resisting what was happening, feeling my loneliness, feeling me, why is this happening to me? Feeling my entitlement, I am too important to be having this terrible experience. And then letting the virus just kill that little me. And feeling such joy and freedom from all of my normal little <laughs> patterns and feeling such compassion for everybody and so much feeling like I'm one with everyone and that anything that happens is just perfect. And I came back to myself and I just felt such huge gratitude for this breath and this breath. So I've been having lots of deep experiences and still sometimes I get triggered into my old trauma. So I had this dream. I'm just going to talk about myself for a little bit and then we'll get to the, the theory stuff, but I just want to be personal a little bit because it also illustrates what I'm going to talk about. So I had this dream that I was at, in my home, but it wasn't my home. It was like some old farmhouse or something. And I went outside and I saw that the front gate to my property was open. And I thought, who opened my gate? Who opened my gate? I was so mad. And I saw that because the gate was open, there were a bunch of rhinos in my property, rhinoceroses, you know, with the mm, and the mm. They were in my property. And I thought, how am I going to get these rhinos out of my property? They're so big and they're so strong and they're so grounded on the earth. I won't be able to move them out. And then I went back inside my house and there was a homeless man there and he was setting fires all around the outside walls of my house. And I said, what are you doing? Don't set fires. And I went to try to run and get water to put out the fires, but there was no water. I couldn't set, I couldn't put out the fires. And I woke up from that dream, like scared. So if I think about that dream in terms of process structure, I think my primary process 
is freaked out and wants the gate closed and wants to get rid of the rhinos and wants to put out the fire. But if I think about my secondary process, the open gate is secondary. The rhinos themselves are secondary. And the homeless man setting fire to the walls is secondary. So I just want to tell you a little bit, not details, but I had a lot of childhood trauma as a lot of people have, probably a lot of you have. And for me, I learned that the world is not safe. And one of the things that I did was that I started very early in life and then continuing, <laughs> continuing, I projected that not safe onto germs and sickness, right? So nervous about getting sick or, oh, who's this or that? Oh, that person sneezed, I should go away from them, you know? That's like part of how I've dealt with my trauma over the years. And so after I had that dream, I had to go shopping for my family. We were shopping for a whole week and I had the whole list of stuff and I went shopping and I was in the store and there were all these other people around and I was scared. I was in a trauma reaction. I was, everybody, they were, that person's coming too close or, oh, I want to reach out and get that milk, but ooh, did somebody touch it and it's got COVID-19 on it? I don't know if any of you have had this experience. You're probably way less crazy than I am about stuff like this, right? But I was tense and I was scanning for danger everywhere. I was hyper vigilant, right? And I was waiting in line to go pay and the guy behind me kept coming too close to me. He was waiting in line too. And I was so nervous. And then I remembered the rhinoceros. And suddenly I just felt whew, grounded like that rhinoceros. I just felt absolutely mm, immovable like that rhinoceros. And I felt, you know how rhinoceros, they have these real, this really thick skin, it's like armor. And I felt this thick skin all around me. And I felt safe and grounded. And then in that moment, I remembered the fire around my walls. And I just set fire to the walls all around me. And when the walls burned down suddenly, I started looking around at the people around me and they weren't threatening to me. They were people. And I saw they were all scared and I felt so much love for them and compassion for them. It opened up my gate. Somebody said the ring of fire protects. For me, it was very different than that. The ring of fire burned down my walls. It opened up my gate so that I could let in the humanity around me. It reminded me of a poem by Mizuto Masahide. I'm probably saying his name wrong. He was a 17th century Japanese poet and samurai. He was a student of Basho. And he wrote, my barn, having been burned down, I can now see the moon. Yeah. So I just want to say, I could burn those walls, but I couldn't do that when I was in a trauma reaction. First, I needed the rhino to get settled and grounded and protected and safe. And that's what this class is about. It, it, sometimes when we're in such big trauma reactions, 
we can't process. We're going to talk about that later. Now, I just want to say, I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes I judge myself if I'm having a trauma reaction. Are you like that at all? I judge myself if I'm having a hard time. I think I should always be having these deep experiences. I should always know, be able to go over my edge into the secondary process and open up to the world and be an elder and I right and, and if I'm having a little me experience, if I'm scared, if I'm all messed up, then I judge myself sometimes. The Buddhists call that the second arrow, right? The first arrow, they say, goes inside. That's our suffering, right? I'm just suffering. That's the first arrow. The second arrow that I shoot into myself is the arrow that judges myself for my suffering, right? So the second arrow is not very helpful. The first arrow is bad enough, right? So I appreciate a, a tool from Buddhism about self-compassion. I learned it from Tara Brock and also from Kristen Neff. I just want to lead you through it for a moment. Feel free to do it or feel free not to do it. It's up to you. Um, and uh, Andrew's going to put it in the chat. So you'll have it for later. And also we're going to email you uh, uh, the different inner works and stuff afterwards. So, but think of something in the moment that you're suffering about a little bit maybe connected to the pandemic or the shutdown or economic problems that you're having or that the world is having and just put your hands on your heart for a moment and feel your suffering and just say to yourself this is a moment of suffering and then say to yourself Millions of people around the world are suffering in the same way that I'm suffering right now. Because it's true. No matter how you're suffering, there's probably a lot of people who are suffering just in that way. And then feel and say to yourself, I feel compassion for them. I don't want them to suffer. And then say to yourself, and I'm one of them. I'm one of those millions of people who are suffering right now about that. And I have compassion for them so I can have compassion for myself as one of them. Yeah, just feel that. This is such a helpful little tool. It's so easy. And it just helps me to open my heart and to remember that we're all connected. And you know, the point is not to always be doing great, right? The point is that when we're having a hard time, we can find a resource or a tool to help us get back up, to help us find ourselves again, to help us regain our capacities. And that reminds me of a quote from Nelson Mandela. He said, do not judge me by my success. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. That's resilience. That's what we're talking about. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about trauma. All right. I love how process work has gotten inspiration and tools from so many different areas and paradigms like Taoism and Jung and quantum physics and 
gestalt therapy and movement therapy and organizational development, right? So I'm going to do the same thing here, staying deeply rooted in process work, but also inspired by and, and borrowing from like the fields of neuroscience and trauma work, especially uh, sensory motor psychotherapy and um, Janina Fisher. Their work fits beautifully and seamlessly together with process work, and I love to combine them. So let's talk about what happens when there's trauma. You're going along with life, bum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum, and you're just one person. And then trauma happens, and there's a split. Part of you goes on with life, and a part of you stays behind exactly like what happened when there was the trauma, right? This is what they find in neuroscience and in, 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 in the latest trauma research, that there's a split. Part of you goes on with life and part of you stays behind right here. And this part that stays behind, it's a young split off part. It sees the world through the lens that was there in the moment of trauma. It feels the same emotions that it was feeling back then. And it has the same body experience. Well, this part is off having a good time. Now, this is the same exact thing that C.G. Jung talked about. He said that trauma creates an autonomous splinter personality. Autonomous means it just is going on its own. It's, it's free of us. It just keeps going. And it's a splinter because it's split off. And it's a whole personality. He called it a complex. And it's got images and affect or feelings and a sensory motor component. That's the same thing that I just said. So C.G. Jung was 100 years ago, way ahead of his time. And the latest trauma research shows that it shows that we remember trauma with our bodies. It's not that, so when I was in that trauma reaction at the store, I wasn't thinking, oh, this is like when I was a kid. I was just having a body feeling. I was remembering it with, with my body. It's called an implicit memory, an, an implicit, not explicit. An explicit memory is, oh, I know what happened then. I remember when I was seven, this and this happened. That's an explicit memory. An implicit memory is I just feel like what was happening then. It seems like it's happening now, but it's actually a memory. So when we're triggered, brain scans show that when we're triggered, the same neural pathways are going as happened then. We feel the emotions of that part. We see the world through its eyes. We feel it through its body. So last week, I went shopping again. Shopping is the worst thing. I went shopping again, and uh, I brought the food home. And for one moment, I was paralyzed. I thought, oh no, but what if that food has the virus on it? What, do I have to wash it? Am I gonna put it in my refrigerator? What, and I was just paralyzed for a moment. And I said to my wife, I wanna go home. And my wife said, you are home. And I just said, but I wanna go home. It seemed like it was happening now, but actually it was an implicit memory of a traumatized child that I used to be, where home wasn't safe. I wanted to go home, but home wasn't safe, right? It seemed like it's happening now. That's what trauma's like. Okay, I wanna share my screen for a moment. Let's see if I can figure this out. 
share screen. Desktop. Oops. There we go. Share screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay, good. All right. Well, let's see if I can get rid of this. There we go. Okay. So here on this side, right, our nervous system has three levels of arousal, right? Normally, when there's no trauma, normally we spend most of our time here in the window of tolerance, right? It's called the window of tolerance because our feelings and our reactions are tolerable. We can think and we can feel this at the same time. Some people also call it the optimal arousal zone because you're not too aroused and you're not too little bit aroused, right? And we can adapt to our environment here and we can process. If we go out of our window of tolerance, let's say we go up into hyper arousal here, right? Our frontal lobes turn off. The frontal lobes, that's the thinking mind, that turns off, right? And we're just here in, we get, we get way too, fight, fight, run away, run away, right? It's like a lion jumps on you, right? And, and no, 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 I'm going to fight that lion or woo, I'm going to get out of there. I'm going to run away. That's called hyper arousal. But then the problem, we dealt with the problem and whew, we come back down into our window of tolerance, right? That's, or maybe we're in a situation where our body feels, ah, oh, don't move. It's not safe, right? So we collapse. We're immobilized, right? Like the, when the gazelle is running from the lion and the lion is just about to get it and the gazelle collapses and it seems like the gazelle is dead and the lion thinks i don't want to eat that that's dead and goes away and then the gazelle shakes and jumps up and goes away right so or or if we're sick and we just sleep and sleep or if we're outside and we break our leg we just lie there right? This is called hypo arousal. Up here, it's hyper arousal. This is hypo arousal. And then when that problem is done, we come back into our window of tolerance, right? That's the normal way it should happen, okay? Now, if we have a history of trauma, on the other hand, right? Here's, here's again that window of tolerance, right? If we have a history of trauma, we can get triggered again and again into hyperarousal. And then we have something like chronic hyperarousal, hyper right? We, we, we're always in fight or flight. We're always anxious. We're always hypervigilant, looking around for where's the problem. Or we can go into chronic hypoarousal, where we get chronically depressed or hopeless or in despair or dissociated right? It's hard when there's trauma to come back into the window of tolerance. Now, the problem is when we're outside of our window of tolerance, right, we can't tolerate what's happening. We're overwhelmed by our experience, and we can't think clearly. We don't have our full capacity, and we can't process, right? That's the problem for what we're talking about, right? We can't process. Oh, I, 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 I stopped sharing my screen too early. Hold on one second. I wanted to share my screen some more. I forgot about that. I'm going to share it again. Okay. Let's see. I can't see you anymore but hopefully you can see me. Um, let's see, okay. Yeah, can you see my screen again? Can you see my screen again? Okay, good, thank you. So this chart about the window of tolerance reminds me of another chart that we've seen a lot these days, right? You may know this chart, right? Here's, uh, it's, it's, it's about flattening the curve. Do you know this chart? Have you seen this, right? Here's the number of cases of COVID-19, 
and here's the time since the first case. And if we don't protect ourselves, right, by social distancing and washing hands and working from home, the number of cases is gonna go up very high and it's gonna go over the capacity of the healthcare system. This is what happened in Italy, right? This is what happened in China. But if we take protective measures, then we're gonna be able to stay within the capacity that the healthcare system can tolerate. That's very much like this. The collective process and the individual process is very similar, right? So we need to regulate ourselves and take care of ourselves so we can stay within our window of tolerance and not stay in our trauma response, right? In other words, we have to make sure that our inner healthcare system has the capacity to tolerate and work with what's happening inside of us. Does that make any sense to anybody? Yeah. Hi, Elaine, there's a question from Tim really Harlan. Interesting thing. So in the world, whoops, I'm gonna find you all again. Where did you go? There we go. So in the world, we're flattening the curve using social distancing. And one way to flatten the curve inside is the same way to take a distance from your difficult experience, right? There's lots of ways to do that. You know, you can stop obsessively looking at the news. How many cases are there today, right? Or you can do something fun or you can watch a movie or you can use mindfulness, right? Thousands of years of different spiritual traditions, right? As you, you have used mindfulness, process work uses mindfulness all the time, right? Now this is happening. Now this is happening. It's a key aspect of process-oriented inner work and it grows our meta communicator, right? When we notice that something's happening, rather than just being in it, then this turns on the frontal lobes of our brain and we're able to process what happens. We're not just overwhelmed by the experience, we have a bit of distance from it, right? So this inner distancing also points to very good inner work methods that can be really helpful and deep. So I wanna just try one right now. Um, and uh, Andrew's gonna put it in the chat but just let me lead it through, lead you through it. You don't have to look at the chat, I'll lead you through it. And again, we're gonna send these to you. And please, to be trauma informed, if, you're, if you feel this is not right for you, that it's gonna get you more triggered, don't do it because don't do anything that's gonna push you further out of your window of tolerance. My hope is that it's going to help you get back into your window of tolerance. But if you feel that it's doing the opposite, just stop, stretch, relax, go get a tea or something, okay? But it's just going to be quick. So if it feels right for you, notice what you're feeling right now. And now remember a bit of distress or suffering that you have felt about the pandemic or about social distancing or the shutdown or your financial situation. Because we don't have a lot of time, don't do a big distress, just a, a small one. And if you don't feel any distress, feel into the distress of somebody else who's suffering. Okay, now, Remember somebody who supports you or loves you or somebody from your past who has supported you or loved you. And imagine that that person is with you now. And look at them. Are they sitting or standing? What's their posture? 
What's the expression on their face? What's the feeling in their eyes? And now imagine what they would say to you or how they would be with you. And now shape shift and be that person. Drop who you are and just let yourself be that person. And you as that person, feel your love and support for the one who's in distress. Feel your love and support for that one over there who's suffering. Yeah, you can do that again another time. We're, we're, we're going to go on now. Um, sorry, we're doing so short with these inner works, <laughs> trying to get through stuff here. Um, and I'm going to work with somebody at the end, so I want to leave time for that also. So when you felt your distress, and then you remembered the person who supports you, you took the attention away from your suffering for a moment, you distanced from it. But when you imagined being that person, you got even further away from the one who suffers. But then you could look back at yourself and you could feel care for the one who suffers, right? This is very similar to what Janina Fisher says. Janina Fisher is an amazing trauma therapist. She wrote the book, I highly recommend it, Healing the Fragmented Selves of Trauma Survivors. Healing the Fragmented Selves of Trauma Survivors. Andrew, would you mind putting that in the chat? Janina Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. Healing the Fragmented Selves of Trauma Survivors. And then she says, like all trauma people that uh, these days, the trauma reaction is an implicit memory. And she says that the trauma reaction that we're having is a communication from that young split off traumatized part. And she said, if we go more into the distress of that part, we're going to get further out of our window of tolerance. What's more helpful is to realize this is an implicit memory, even though it feels like it's happening now. And when we realize this is an implicit memory, it already gives us a bit of distance from that part, right? And Janina Fisher suggests that we identify with the grown up with the wise mind, with the, the part of all of us that has gone on, that's learned a lot, that is compassionate, right? That can love people, right? This is the bigger part of us, not a split off part. The problem is, she says, if we blend with or identify with the traumatized part, if we feel its feelings and become it, then there's nobody home to take care of it, right? There's nobody there to take care of it. Can you see that? That is such a big thing, right? So she suggests that we unblend from that part. We identify with the bigger, older person we are, and then we can connect with and take care of that young traumatized part. That is such a game changer in my view about working with trauma, right? Now this may seem at first strange to a process worker, right? In process work, we're constantly practicing identifying 
with the disturbing experience or even amplifying the disturbing experience, becoming that part, right? Which is great in 90% of the situations. Amazing, it helps us to grow, it helps us to find amazing parts of ourselves that we don't know about. Unfortunately, if we identify with the traumatized part, that pushes us further out of our window of tolerance, which diminishes our ability to process things because our, the front of our brain just turns off. Right? So on the one hand, it may seem strange to a process worker. On a, from another point of view, it's not strange at all for process work because process work has many practices that help us connect with our bigger and wiser self, right? We work with the big you, with the process mind, with the earth spot, dancing with the universe, et cetera, et cetera, right? What Janina's work adds is that once we connect with our bigger, wiser self, it's helpful to come back to that little one who's suffering, that split off part, and to connect with it and care for it, right? So when we experience trauma, I don't know if this, you can relate to this, many people, when we experience trauma, we feel alone. And so that split off traumatized part feels alone too. So if we just go off into the universe, that's beautiful and fantastic, but this part may still feel alone. Um, so, and often the ones who hurt us were also the ones who were supposed to be caring for us. So there's also often an attachment to trauma, right? So if we, the bigger self, the grown up, the wise mind, can come back to that young split off part and connect with it and care for it, that can heal old wounds and it can soothe the split off part, the split off child part. So we can come back into our window of tolerance and this allows us to meet the present situation, whatever it is, with all of who we are. Okay, that was a lot. And I forgot before to, take time for questions. I was going to see if there were questions before. Andrew, you want to say some questions? Yes. Uh, here we go. I got to scroll back there a ways here. Uh, Tim had a question. Maybe Tim, maybe you can ask it. Are you on? Yeah. Hi, Lane. Hey, Tim. Curious. Hi, Tim. Hey. Hey. When hey. we were... When you were doing the um, hyperarousal, hypoarousal, I was just curious if getting stuck in that kind of swirl of doubt and indecision, is that considered a hypoarousal expression? Uh, if it's, there's actually a, a, a disagreement among, among trauma workers if, 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 if that kind of paralysis is hypoarousal or if it's hyper, hyper arousal, that you're so hyper aroused that uh, you can't do anything anymore. Um, so, and some people say it's, it's both hyper and hypo at the same time. It's, it's, it's like a paralysis. Um, so I don't know, it's just not fun. And it's definitely not in the window of tolerance. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's what I would say. <laughs> Thanks. So Antara says some call it shutdown. Yeah. So yeah, so shutdown can be like like the gazelle <clears throat> being dead, but not being dead, right? Um, but you know, it can also be like a child who's so like, <gasps> you know, and that seems like hyper arouse. It's it's not just your muscles, hype, hypo arousal is all of your muscles are just bleh. right. So it's not like that. It's, it's anyway, it's some combination, I think, but I don't know. Another question. 
Somebody says in somatic experiencing, it's considered highly activated. I'm, I'm with you. That, that's, that's my point of view too. Okay. Um, what, what's another question? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. Um, just wondering about, you mentioned, um, you said for 90% of like, people you might work with like the a process work approach would fit but for 10 percent it would be better to go with going towards the the safe person first before the disturbing experience and i just wondered what you would be looking out for if you're working with someone in that 10 percent like what would it be looking out for their double signals or what what would indicate that uh, which approach to use yeah, I mean, I don't know about 90% of the people. Like, I'm a person the process work works great for, but some of the time I'm, I mean, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and I just want to correct that. I mean, just say it differently. It's not that a process work approach doesn't, use, doesn't work, but it's that I'm suggesting integrating process work with this, with this other kind of idea. Um, uh, which we already have in process work, right? So it's not, I'm, I'm saying process work doesn't work, but to integrate it with this other idea of if somebody is, seems like they're out of their ability to process, mm -hmm. right? Um, I mean, this is why I started studying trauma work because I had been doing process work for so long, but sometimes people just it seemed like they just couldn't process their their it was like they were like all and i would like try to amplify something and it would just make them like feel like like worse so that that's a good indication to like help them come back into themselves and to lower their window of tolerance i i mean i mean gr lower their activation come back into their window of tolerance and grow their window of tolerance Mm -hmm. Right. So just grounding yourself can be really helpful. Just coming back into your body can be really helpful. Although for some people coming back into their body, their body is where that's happening. So can you find a different part of their body where there isn't something activated happening so that then they can have that experience there or yeah. Mm -hmm. breathing yes breathing exactly breathing and just but but a certain kind of breathing they say actually can help so so when you're hyper activated it it it, it turns that means that your sympathetic nervous system is up right and so there are certain kinds of breathing that help your parasympathetic nervous system to come up like if you have a breath in and then a breath out that's twice as long as the breath in, right? Then that can help turn on the parasympathetic nervous system, which calms us down, right? Changing channels, Gabriella, exactly. Changing channels can be a very important experience. That's right, that's right. So for instance, for me in that uh, lower abdomen, a lot of people have great ideas. Um, so um, let's hear one more question and then I, oh, I don't know, know if we have time for another question. Is that okay? Does anybody else have a very pressing question or can I go on? I can go on. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. Okay, so I'm gonna go on um, and yeah. So I wanna recommend a, an inner work and um, I'm just gonna tell about it very quickly and then I want to try it with somebody and Kirsten has said that she would do it with me so um so it's about bringing to mind an aspect of the pandemic or shutdown that causes you suffering and then remembering your feelings or sensations that you were distressed about where in your body do you experience that? And assuming for the moment that this feeling or sensation is a communication from a younger part of you, 
right? That young split off part of you. Now, this is basic communication theory that we use in process work all the time, right? Paul Vaslavik said that every signal is a communication from a sender to a receiver in a certain channel, right? So the signal is your distress, ah, right? So, so we have to assume that that comes from a part of you that's sending that signal. And so we're just, we're just having the hypothesis that that part that's sending that signal is that part that's split off during trauma at some point, right? And then we're gonna find out what's the message that that part is communicating. And then we're going to disidentify with it and imagine that younger part and finding out about it and then taking distance from it. And we're gonna to go to an earth spot and then feel how we feel in that earth spot. And then we're gonna feel we're going to make that into a figure, the feeling of what it's like to be in that earth spot into a figure. And then feel what's the basic feeling there of that figure and, and, and shape shift into that figure. And then be with that part. That's the basic inner work. And the reason we make the earth spot into a figure is because of what I said before, that so much of it is around attachment and that part feeling alone. So if we're just like in the universe or we're just, it's just an earth spot, it's not very related often, right? So, so uh, this exercise is about transform, changing channels as somebody said, and letting that be a figure so that we can come back and be with that part and care for it. Okay, how is that? Let's, so, so Kirsten, are you there? Mm. Somebody asked a question, Joseph asked a question about an earth spot. What's an earth spot? Oh yeah, okay. Joseph, nice to hear from you. You're not a process worker, you're a, you're a psychologist doing a lot of other fantastic things. Um, and uh, yeah, an earth spot is a spot on the earth where you feel really well. Okay, we work with that a lot in process work. So there's Kirsten. How are you doing this morning or this, at, this evening? This evening here, yeah. I'm from Germany. Yeah, so far so good. Okay, hopefully it stays good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes, I'm getting a little bit nervous when you started to talk about where to pin me being on the spot, um, just to frame that. Oh, we, we could, we could, yeah. Are, are you okay? Yes, but I'm fine working with you. Okay. All fine. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Kirsten, what is an aspect of the pandemic or the shutdown, uh, social distancing that causes you some kind of suffering? Um, yeah, what I realized that I do not suffer so much from being on my own, which I'm quite used to because I work a lot from home and also on, on uh, Zoom. But what I realized is, um, talking to other people actually is that I'm more in contact with the need of contact. I, not ha I don't have a very active social life outside, but through talking to people, this comes more into my mind. You're in contact with the need of contact. Yeah, more than usually. Normally you're happy to be alone, but these days you're feeling more needing contact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, normally I wouldn't ask this, but is it okay? If, and you don't have to answer it. Do, does that feel connected to you to some kind of traumatic experience? Yes. I mean, I was thinking about it and reflecting on that and I can share is that. that is that okay to share? I normally yes. wouldn't ask about that because 
you don't want to ask people about their traumas, but um, are, are you okay with that? Yes, I'm fine with talking about it. Mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid, I often was in hospitals. And at that time, usually you didn't have any contacts to your family. You were kind of locked in the hospital. And um, so that's an experience of like looking at my parents through a window, glass window mm -hmm. for several weeks. And um, also uh, one, in one time I was in the hospital for several months when wow. I was little. Wow, how little? The first time I was four, the second I was six, so several times. Wow, wow. So looking at your parents through the glass window. Hmm. Yeah. That was like the contact I had. Yeah, wow. And how does that get triggered now? You... Yeah, it's a little bit becomes a uh, comes more up into my awareness, like being on uh, on the windows. Like at the moment, <laughs> we are on Zoom, looking at each other. It's a little bit like that. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. The only contact is uh, yeah. Looking to the through the window through the screen of your computer. Yeah. Maybe Andrew, maybe that would be good to to put that in there if you if you can. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So, uh, so go on and 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 hmm. feel into that need for contact, or or is it a distress that you don't have contact? How do you notice it? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, it's getting even more activated at the moment, talking to you and being on the spot. It's like being watched at. So mm -hmm. I'm just realizing, wow, that's part of that, being watched at. Yes. Oh, yeah. It's not just that you can't reach them, it's that they are watching you. Yes. And what do you notice in your body as, as, as you're noticing that now? Um, it's like what we were talking before and I'm a little bit activated so more you know a little stressed while at the same time a little bit distance from my body not fully in my body not fully in your body yes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so you so which one of those experiences or or let's let's yeah mm. Where are you noticing that? Yeah, uh huh. I'm very much on my head, looking and thinking and talking, mm -hmm. but the rest of my body is kind of separated from my head. It's separated. It's there. Yes. Yeah. It's a, uh, kind of a dissociation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So feel into that separation, and let's imagine that that is a communication from that younger part. And what is she communicating? Something about it's dangerous to be in my body because I mean being the hospital hospital also meant to have a lot of pain. Um, staying out of my body is safer mm. and less painful. It's dangerous to be in my body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And when you look at her, what do you see? So, so okay, now let's imagine her there in the hospital. That one yeah. who feels it's dangerous to be in my body. Yes, okay. What do you see? A bed with a lot of machines around. 
have an intensive care station, uh, how you say, intensive care unit. Yeah. Um, machines controlling the body. Mm -hmm. and what do you see when you look at her? She looks pretty small with all the machines. Mm -hmm. She looks small, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you notice her face or her eyes? Yeah, with closed eyes, just lying there very silently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let's now take some distance from her mm -hmm. and from that experience and think of an earth spot where you feel really well somebody somebody needs to get on mute yeah thank you okay a spot yeah yeah okay where are you thinking Um, it's an earth spot I often go to when it popped up immediately when you said earth spot. It's um, in the center of Jerusalem on the holy mountain. Mm. Mm. Okay, so just notice what you see there mm -hmm. and what you hear, what you smell. And now, yeah. Yeah. Now shift your awareness away from what you're seeing and notice, shift your awareness to your own experience of what it's like being there. What do you notice in your body, in your being? It's very vivid, very... Mm, I'm doing the hand movement. I don't know how to put it in words. Very like this. That's your inner experience is like mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like that's, this. That's right. Feel into that. That vivid. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, lots of energy. Lots of energy, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. And now imagine a person or somebody or somebody from a myth who has that quality. Mm. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> Sorry, it takes so long. No problem. It's like, it's like a dragon figure. Very big. A dragon figure? Yeah. Very big dragon. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. What's that, what's that dragon doing? Yeah. Yeah. What's that dragon doing? It's like blowing fire. Ooh. And pretty, you know, it's big legs big. walking on the ground and the ground is shaking. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now go on and shape shift and become that for a moment. Okay. Yeah. Let's do this. That, yeah. When, boom, boom, boom. Uh, boom, boom. Nice. I like the rhythm. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 
<laughs> and dear dragon, what is your basic feeling and attitude about life? Uh, I'm actually just enjoying myself. You're enjoying <laughs> yourself. I didn't feel just being here. You're enjoying just being yeah. here. Yeah. Oh. Here I am. <laughs> here I am. Just enjoying life. Enjoying being here. Yeah. That's right. Well. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. What? Yeah, I was just being, not being bothered a lot about anything, not which being, is not so much primary for me. That's not primary <laughs> for you, yeah. Oh. That's not normal for you. Just be enjoying being here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Now look through your dragon eyes at that little girl in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like that. We'll do the same thing again, sorry. Just go like this. What, when, when you see her, dear dragon, what happens inside of you? What do you, what, what, what's your impulse? Yeah, it's like just, I don't know, wait, 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 slow. Just, just going through, ignoring whatever is there, but just going there and being in contact. You want to be in contact with her. Yeah. Oh. Ignoring the windows, the whatever, you know. <laughs> <laughs> crashing through the windows, crashing through the machines, just and just imagine yourself being in contact with her. How would you yeah. do that? How would you make contact with her? Oh, I do it already. It's like through deep breathing and connecting and waiting for her to recognize me. Okay, so let's imagine there you are, you're breathing, you're waiting, you're mm -hmm. waiting for her to recognize you, yes? And what does she do? <laughs> now the picture changes. She seems really happy that someone is there. She got happy that you happy. came. Yeah. She was happy that you came. How do you know? How do you know she's happy? What do you see? The picture is changing. Like she's sitting in the bed and being happy. Someone is there to play with her. Yes. And how does that feel to you, dear dragon, that you were able to help her sit up and make her happy? Very good. It feels good to you. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to invite you, dear dragon, to say to her, hey, it feels very good to be with you here. You make me feel very good. Yeah. Go on and imagine. So good to be with you, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and, yes. And, then, and, and look to see her reaction. And look and listen. Yeah, what I see and what I hear is also that that she was waiting for someone really connecting with her and waiting for her to wake up. Yes. Yeah, maybe I need to frame, I was also in a coma when I was little, so yeah. I feel like when I look at her now, so it's so good what you're doing. It's like she's coming back on a free will now. She's there, present. She's coming back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She's present. Somebody waited for her and they didn't just look at her and then leave. Yes. Yes. Right. Somebody waited yeah. for her. Yes. Yes. So what do you, dear dragon, want to say when when you see that she's happy that that you waited for her and that she woke up to herself? not so much about saying it's I feel like grabbing her and just taking her out into the world oh. yeah. yeah 
It's not, about, you, not much about words. It's not much about words. And what does she do when no. you grab her with your big claws and, and <laughs> take her into the world? Happy to go outside? Yes, let's go. Okay, beautiful. Now, yeah. dear dragon, you have her on your back. Now I want to talk to you as you're walking out into the world with her. <laughs> the two of you walking out into the world. Before you go all the way, I just want to ask you, dear dragon, when you look at all this social distancing and how people are on screens all the time, <laughs> how would you handle that, dear dragon? To stay in your I mean getting as much out of what's going on the screen as possible. Getting as much I cannot go with my physical body through the screen, but I wish wish I could. Yes. <laughs> To get as much life and contact from the screen, not just be on the screen and look and be looked at, but hello over there. Oh, I've been <laughs> waiting for you. Nice to be with you. Let's really get something out of this right now. <laughs> Let's get something out of this session. If with the, that I'm going to have with my client. Let's get something. Whoa, I'm actually seeing my friend. Oh, whoa. <laughs> yes, oh, I've been you. waiting for you. Yes. To really be related and yeah. alive and not just half comatose in front of it. Yeah. Beautiful. You totally said what I'm feeling. Great. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow. All right. Can we come back? To, do you need uh, anything else? No, thanks so much. Oh, so, thanks awesome. so much for being there with me, for everybody, and holding that was very important. Thanks we so love to be with you. We love to. We've been waiting for you to come <laughs> back. Yes, thank you. Actually, we've thank been you. waiting for the little one to come back, but we've also been waiting for the dragon to come and wake us up. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Okay. Let's come back, everybody. Let's go back, yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm now going up to the upper right side and doing speaker view. Okay. This is a moment. You're getting a lot of appreciations <laughs> over here on chat. Yes. Beautiful. Who wants to say something about that work? Somebody say something about Kirsten and her work, not, not yet about the details of what we did, just the feeling of what that was like. Somebody say something. Hi, Bara. Hello. Hi. Bara. Hi. I just want to say that I love it. And it's so touching because I, like, that Kirsten also worked for me. So thank you so much. Yay. Somebody else say something. Hi, Kirsten. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Who is this? Yes. Hi, Hi Sylvia. I just also want to thank you because it was really touching and uh, like you really make me feel contact with you and these and I really, it, it, it just pushed me to the screen and look because till then I was cooking and it's just refreshing, joyful and really beautiful. Thank you, Ryan and Kirsten. Really nice. Oh. Thanks, Sylvia. And enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> enjoy Dragon. Dragon was great. Thank you, Dragon, that you came to help us to feel us through the screen. Yeah, Gabriella on chat says, Kirsten, the dragon passed through my screen. Felt so much <laughs> contact with you and power to be in contact despite barriers and screens. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Okay, who has a question? or a comment about this way of working or about anything that I said or about this, the, the why? Oh, oh, I just want to say one thing. There I am asking for a question and then talking more. Sorry about that. I'll try to be brief. 
So this thing that we did at the end, it's around the attachment, right? It's around the contact, right? This is really, there, there was a lot of physical pain and coma and all kinds of problems with this trauma, but a big part of the trauma was about the attachment trauma, right? She was, first of all, not even attached to herself in the trauma. And she also wasn't attached to anybody on the outside. So the dragon was able to use the power of the dragon, which is the power of the earth spot, which is the power of the dreaming, right? To come back in, but then personify that, not just be the hill in the middle of Jerusalem, but to be the dragon that's in that. And, and, uh, and then come back and make contact to heal that attachment trauma and show a different way forward. Okay. Somebody ask something or say something about this kind, this way of working or whatever. Question about the dyad, question about the trauma work. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Matthew. Yeah. Um, I was just I was just thinking of what it what you said before about the times when you uh, would amplify something and then the times when you would go for this different, more trauma aware approach. And I was just I was just wondering how those two different things played out in in that session, and I was just wondering how did you know how long to stay with that that first phase of exploring what that experience was like, and how did you know when to move from that into into the next phase of, of the earth spot? Fantastic questions, fantastic questions. So first of all, Matthew, um, what I did not do is when, when, when Kirsten said, I'm kind of detached from my body, I was kind of detached from my body, or right now I feel kind of out of my body. What I did not do was amplify that signal. Um, because amplifying that signal would, would be getting more dissociated. And if you're more dissociated, it's hard to process, right? So even the, the first part was, um, what do you notice now? And then, okay, quickly, quickly switch to, um, let's see, how did I write it there? Quickly switch to, okay, now imagine that that is a communication from a younger part, right? There's already the distancing there. It, it's, not, it's not going away from it, but it's not doing that more, right? So it's, it's a communication, it's a channel change. It's following Botslavik and communication theory, right? It's, it's deep process work, but it's, it's knowing when not to use the amplification method in that moment. The amplification method was helpful later, but not in that moment because that's a non-resourced place. If we're gonna amplify the place where we don't have resource, then that can sometimes not go well or not go as deeply because we are, are, are the front of our brain is turned off. So first of all, that distance, and then see that as a communication. And then when I was asking about that, that one who was, who was there as a young child, I wasn't going into her experiences. I was asking about it. So that allowed Kirsten to be able to have her meta communicator talking about that one's experience rather than uh, being that experience. So there was that. And then, I don't know, somebody asked me this question the other day, how do you know when that's enough? There's just a 
feeling of we've gotten the information that we need. There wasn't something new necessarily that was coming, right? We got that information and now let's go to the next step. Um, let, let's get even a little bit, in, in that situation, it's getting more distance, but it's also let's go into something where there is a resource, right? There, this, this part didn't have many resources, but, but Kirsten has a lot of resources and the earth spot has a lot of resources. So then going into that. And then once we're in the earth spot, then there's all of our incredible process work amplification tools can be used there and then channel changing and, and shape shifting and becoming, what is this? Okay, there it was, there's a movement. Okay, make that, oh, and there's a, and then keeping doing that until it, uh, then, we, then we find out who or what that is. And then we can be that dragon and then, and then it's got a movement component and a sound component and the earth is shaking and then we know all about that, right? So that's the moment then to use all those incredible process work amplification techniques. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. That's great. Thanks for your great question. Michelle says, Lane, please say a bit more about how to move toward unmerging from the younger traumatized one when the person is starting from a more dissociated, disidentified place. Like Kirsten at first described the hospital room without describing her little girl in it. That's right, because the little girl wasn't really there, right? She was gone. In a, in a way, one way to think about that, I'll get back to your question, in a way, it wasn't just the parents who were looking at the girl through, a, through the window. The girl herself was outside of her body looking back at herself through the window, right? So let's go back to your thing. Um, I heard you ask her to describe little Kirsten to call her back. Please say more about the polarity between dissociated and merged. I am also hearing you discuss how to how you moved Kirsten toward where she's resourced. So this, Michelle, is really the the art and what what you're asking is really the big question how to unmerge from the traumatized part. That's really the big question. And there's different ways to do that. I really highly suggest Janina Fisher's book. Um, uh, one way of doing that is to remember just that first, that first thing. Let's, um, this is a memory, right? That itself is like, oh, yeah, that's a memory. That's not me. It seems like me, but that's a memory. And then the next thing is, this is the experience of that girl, right? So when I, when I asked her to describe the little Kirsten, I wasn't trying to call her back, as you suggest. I was trying to help the big Kirsten, the one who's working with me here, to notice her, right? That also is a kind of unmerging, right? It's a developing of the meta communicator. I can notice that one, I don't have to be her, right? So that's another way of doing that. Another way of doing that, it, it, there's all kinds of somatic resources that can be very helpful, right? So for instance, <laughs> grounding, your feet on the floor, pressing your feet into the floor. Also a very useful one, somatic resource uh, from sensory motor psychotherapy is lengthening the spine and letting your, 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 the crown of your head push up toward the sky and, the, and the, your tailbones going down toward the floor that helps lengthen the spine. Very often, if the, tr if, the, 
if that split off part is small, right, or dissociated, that if we lengthen the spine, that itself can be helpful in not being that part anymore, right? There's a great cartoon from Charlie Brown. I don't know if you know Charlie Brown in different parts of the world, but there's a great cartoon where Charlie Brown is like this. And he says to his friend, I love being like this when I'm depressed. I love having this posture when I'm depressed. Because if I sit up like this, I won't feel depressed anymore. And then that takes all the fun out of being depressed, right? So, so just using the body, right, can be also a way of getting into another state or getting into another part of ourselves. So that's a short answer to your very important question. Who else has a question? If writes, when you would when you choose to use a mythic character versus the normal life self for contact with the younger part. So great question, Joseph. So very often, like with Janina's work, and very often this is what I do, I is 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 that we we can use not a mythic part, but your grown up wise mind, right? Um, to contact, to contact that one, right? And then that, uh, and then when what we're doing is we're creating an attachment between the grown up who we are now and that little split off one, right? Because that one is that one doesn't have that doesn't have any attachment, right? In Chris, in Kirsten's situation, was all alone, but very often there's a problem with attachment. So we're creating a secure attachment. I'm with you. I'm with you. I got you. I got you. That's right. Oh, yeah. And anyway, there's a whole way. Watch my, watch my other trauma video from Process Work Online, and, and you'll see more about that. Um, so, uh, so in this situation, it's going to a mythic part in a way it it can be a, a a fun and deep way to get to even a wiser part of yourself right because sometimes uh sometimes clients have a hard time getting to a wise getting to what janina fisher calls the wise mind right but that if if going to the earth spot or something like that, finding that mythic figure, then you're already there. I have to say, I was a little nervous when Kirsten came up with a dragon because I was a little nervous how that little girl was going to fare with a fire-breathing dragon, but uh, it turned out well, luckily. Okay, let, let me see. Uh, Michelle says, inner higher parent, bringing the inner good parent online internally, inner high self bringing it online. Yes, Michelle. And then Michal said, oh, this is Michal, great. It was very helpful for me to switch the direction of the caring. Instead of asking the little one to say what she needs, you ask the earth spot figure for suggestions. And that could be helpful with clients who don't really know what the little one needs. I love what you're saying, Michal, thank you. Um, so, okay, friends. Great to see everybody. It's, it's lovely. I wish we had another two hours. I would love to go even deeper into this and work with other people and uh, go into all the details. And uh, feel free to email me. Hold on one second. I'm going to write my email address here. Lane, L-A-N-E, at processworklane.com. There it is. It already got lost in all the thank yous. Thank you, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Lots of love. Good luck. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Stay deeply well. Stay connected to your deepest self. Lots of love to everybody.